Morning, everyone. Well, this is lovely, isn't it? Um, and this, well, what is this exactly? Any ideas? Shout out through your moss if you think you know what this might be. Oh, almost. Stripping the gender away from the drugs, what we call the Oh, but that's a bit techy for me, sorry. Um, it's a shameless plug, everybody. Oh. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. And, nice. <laughs> <laughs> and so is this, actually. This is also a shameless plug. Um, there were certain things which, like you, I did a lot more of during lockdown. Uh, firstly, I ate far too many crisps. Um, and I'm going to not talk too much about crisps because I'm conscious that we do have some crisp aficionados in the audience. And when, when Kieran arrives, I will defer to him on specialist crisp and specifically Tato knowledge. Um, I also watch far too many cop dramas, old 70s cop dramas being my favourite. Um, so particularly The Sweeney. Shut it, and that kind of thing. Um, and the professionals, which as an ex-intelligence analyst, I'm particularly partial to. That's exactly how intelligence analysis works in law enforcement, by the way, in case you were wondering. Um, but I also, like all of you, decided to use the time to write a book. And my full confessional, which is kind of in the book, the tell-all, um, is that my background isn't in information security or cyber at all. I read classics at university. My PhD is in Roman rhetoric in satire that is 2,000 years old. So political rhetoric, which kind of comes in handy when you look at how governments and vendors, and there will be a little bit of uh, vendor analysis here, and criminals even, represent security issues. So I went all the way back to my heritage. I started with the Emperor Augustus, round about 0 BC, CE, talking about all of his achievements, what he managed to do in his foreign policy, how he protected the empire from external threats. I looked at the US national security strategy. So think about George W. Bush and his war on terror, right? And th the presidents, they write prefaces describing what they're going to do with their security for the coming years. I looked at online harms rhetoric. So the panic that we can induce in people when we tell them that, for instance, online grooming's going up, that children are at risk. And I looked at cyber security. And something shocked me. What shocked me when I looked at cyber was that criminals, governments, and that includes law enforcement agencies, and vendors have a tendency to represent cyber threats in exactly the same way, which is kind of weird when you think about that. So there is, we have to be honest, a certain amount of amplification, threat inflation, tapping into the fear aspect of fear, uncertainty, and doubt. There are notable exceptions. There are some great exceptions. And we see the tide turning a little bit on representing these issues as amplified. But in, in rhetorical terms, in literary terms, what we're actually talking about is hyperbole. So ramping up the threat to make it seem sometimes bigger than it is. And that's not for a second to say that I don't think cyber threats are serious and that you know they don't include threats to national security and critical infrastructure. They absolutely do. But what I'd like you to do just for the next few minutes is a bit of make-believe. Pretend that you are not an information security specialist. Pretend that you are the ordinary punter in the street who has a family, who runs a business, and they want to know how to protect themselves. They want to know how to prevent cybercrime and attacks on them, their loved ones, and their businesses. And so we're going to do that through... A, a, a little test, a, a basic search, if you like. What we also do, and as someone who used to write threat assessments on cybercrime, I'm pretty certain I've done this as well. So, you know, I'm, I'm with you all here, 
is we make it seem more immediate. We make it seem urgent. So if you think about uh, a phishing email, you must click now, you know, or a sextortion email. I've seen you do something pretty disgusting. You need to go here and pay me some Bitcoin. The ransomware pop-up screen that says you have to do something right now. The vendor website that says secure your everything, etc. How we do that in our language, how that's reflected in our communications, the language, but also the visuals, is through metaphors. And with metaphors, it's about taking something that's really abstract, like cybercrime, like cyber threats, like zeros and ones, and turning it into something that ordinary people can relate to. That in itself is laudable, because we need to land the message. But perhaps some of the metaphors we're using are not necessarily appropriate, and they're not necessarily going to be effective. So we're also going to look very, very briefly at what some of the alternatives might be. Just because we've been doing FUD all this time doesn't mean we have to stick with it. There could be other ways of doing this. So I thought to myself, what's the best way to work out what people are being fed in terms of language and images? Um, and, of course, we've got Google Images for that. So this is what you get when you search for cybercrime prevention advice on Google Images. So what are we seeing here? We're seeing a bit of a common theme, aren't we? We're seeing blue light. Ooh, CSI cyber. We're seeing faceless hackers in hoodies. Okay, so it's all a little bit inhuman. Um, what else are we seeing? We're seeing things that you are barred out of. Crime scene tape, padlocks, not for you, not for you ordinary people, unless you can understand the cascading zeros and ones and the code that's running across the screen. This is not for you. Okay, so it's quite exclusive. It's quite prohibitive. And one of those images, I always do this. I always point at the screen. It's not there, you know, um, is this one. Which is, which for four years, I think, was the welcome image on the FBI's cybercrime prevention website. So, so what have we got? We've got, um, a, a, sorry to use this term so early in the morning, but with the rapacious hands and the global background, we've basically got Mr. Global Rapist going, oh, I'm a magician. I'm magicking up numbers, and here's the cascading binary. You won't understand that. This is not for you. Okay. Now, we're used to this, aren't we? We're so inured, desensitized to this imagery. But I suspect that for a certain age group, when you look at someone who is faceless and wearing a hood and coming to get you, actually, it will make them think of this. And one thing we know about the Grim Reaper, with some exceptions, very few exceptions, that I'm very happy to sing you later um, in traditional English and European folk song, you don't get to cheat this guy. You are powerless. If he's coming for you, there is absolutely nothing you can do about it. You don't even know what he looks like. Okay, so this for me, if I'm thinking myself into the position of someone who isn't a cyber or infosec specialist, who doesn't work on this stuff all the time, who isn't desensitized, is that cyber is pointless trying to get your head around because there's nothing you can do about it. Now, there is some text underneath this image. So if you can get past the image, there's a certain amount of information. And um, I've got a script here to read it, make sure I represent it to you accurately. I don't want to misrepresent. But what we're going to do, we're going to follow the same principle. We're going to use images from Google Images for the metaphors that are used in this text. You'll see what I mean. Okay, the FBI says... The collective impact of computer and network intrusions is staggering. Billions of dollars are lost every year repairing systems hit by such attacks. Ransomware is insidious 
And the inability to access important data can be catastrophic in terms of the loss of sensitive or proprietary information, the disruption to regular operations, financial losses incurred to restore systems and files, and the potential harm to an organization's reputation. Now, this depends very much on your particular favorite flavor of catastrophe, whether it's man-made or whether it's natural. Um, the FBI continues, the loss of access to personal and often irreplaceable items, including family photos, videos, and other records, can be devastating for individuals as well. So when we say that something is catastrophic, is a catastrophe, or is devastating in this way, we use them metaphorically, because these words literally refer to large-scale physical destruction. So for you Latin and Greek fans, catastrophe literally means physically bowling something over, and de vasto means raising a town or a village to the ground. So when a football manager says in a post-match interview, oh yeah, I'm totally devastated by the result, he doesn't really mean that he was physically obliterated by it, but it does make it more immediate. It makes it something that we can all relate to. At the same time, however, it's also exaggerating and amplifying in the process. Now, one of the FBI's stated priorities on its public-facing website is what it calls the going dark problem. And many of you will be familiar with the former FBI director, Jim Comey, his testimony on what going dark means. It means lawful. Uh, it's, it's the inability to access encrypted communications. And darkness is, of course, another way in which government agencies, criminals, and vendors all use the same tactics to depict cyber threats. So let's do our same visual analysis for a recent TV ad for a consumer antivirus vendor. And you'll be very pleased to know I've sanitized the name from this because I don't want to get sued. <laughs> Sorry. I know what's coming next. Apologies. I'm laughing at my own jokes at 9.51 in the morning. So imagine a sinister male voice. Today's digital world has a dark side. Because everyday things like shopping, banking, and even browsing online can expose personal information and make people vulnerable to cyber criminals. Lord Vader's coming for that? Good grief, it must be serious. More than 850 million people in 16 countries were victims of cybercrime in the last year alone. Mobile ransomware attacks went up by 33%. 86% of adults may, may, have put their information at risk using public Wi-Fi. And there's a victim of identity theft every two seconds. With 50 million customers around the globe, we are the consumer ally for today's connected world, meeting the dangers of cybercrime with the power of cyber safety. On a mission to secure the digital world just when it needs saving the most, Product X, protectors of the digital universe. Now, if we take all of that imagery together, I would suggest that this is not empowering for your average citizen. This is not empowering for your average business owner. Lord Vader is coming to get you, so it's an intergalactic threat from which, rather like the Grim Reaper, you cannot escape. The numbers, well, it's number salad, isn't it? There's too much going on there. Let's just bowl people over with this. And you need superheroes to save you from it. So this has an impact. This has to have an impact on the levels of capability, which in turn is going to have a negative impact on how empowered people feel to protect themselves. With vendors, we could argue that in some cases, it's just about buying the thing, isn't it? With criminals, it's about doing the thing that they want you to do. So you can see how it's useful, but I would argue that if we're thinking about this 
as a public protection issue, and you'll see how that's relevant in a second, this is exactly the wrong kind of message we want to be getting across to people. And there's a knock-on effect as well. Something I also work on is looking at health and well-being, human resilience, and burnout in the cybersecurity industry and amongst information security specialists. And the more people say that the people who work on cyber are superheroes, I would argue the greater the expectations that it generates that you will all be always on and able to save the world 24-7. And we know those expectations are unreasonable, and we know those expectations are having harmful effects on the people who work in the industry. So it's in all of our interests, and particularly the workforce, to think about this differently, represent it differently. Then you can also think about other use cases for representing it differently. And when you think that the people who are on your boards are also exposed to this kind of imagery that I've just shown you. They are also, as citizens, your non-execs are expecting you to be those superheroes who will save the day 24-7. So there's all sorts of reasons why it's worth looking at alternatives. Okay, so what could those alternatives be? Well, if you've got kids... Um, you will know that Disney um, has done its own representation of the dark web. This is a scene from a uh, Wreck-It Ralph movie, Wreck-It Ralph 2, Ralph Breaks the Internet. And what I like about this is that it breaks down tech issues by a, a kind of extended metaphor, if you like, taking all those abstract contexts and, and mapping them to a physical place. So the internet is a physical place. And the dark web is somewhere that you descend into in an elevator. So, so classics fans, there are some nice comparisons there to Odysseus going down to the underworld in the Odyssey, right? So he goes down in an elevator with this chap called J.B. Spamley, who is an online advertiser. And he goes to buy an insecurity virus because Ralph wants to rescue his best friend, Vanellope von Schweetz, from a driving game that she's, that she's become addicted to. And the driving game is gorgeously entitled Slaughter Race. Possibly not suitable for kids. Um, and so he wants to make the game boring so that she will want to leave. So he says, oh, all right, I'll go and buy a virus. And this is the virus. And the virus is called Arthur. And in a recreation of comic shopkeeper routines that, for those of you who are interested, goes all the way back to 5th century BC Athens. Um, we're, we're kind of, we're recreating the two Ronnie's four candles sketch. We're recreating Monty Python's dead parrot sketch. We're recreating, if you want something a little bit more sinister and scary, purchasing the Mogwai in Gremlins. And actually, this is, this is Double Dan, who's like half man, half slug, Jabba the Hutt. I think he's voiced by Russell Brand or someone who's trying to sound like him. So he's got that kind of so slightly fey, cockney gangster thing going on. Um, and he says, now, you're not going to do anything stupid with this, are you? So we have that sense of impending impact, that something might go wrong. We've got that dramatic irony. The kids who are watching this still are encouraged to see that negative impact, because guess what? It does go wrong. When Arthur is unleashed from the box, he explodes out, and it makes people jump. But what we're doing is we're demystifying it. We're not saying, we're not saying to kids that this is cybergeddon. We're showing them the consequences in a way that they can find accessible, and might actually be lighthearted. Lighthearted could be the way to go. Here's what I think we shouldn't be doing. Okay? It is tempting, I know, to harness the sense of alert that people have in the context of the pandemic. But for me, this is a negative example. I'm going to give you a positive example in a second, and I will finish, I promise, on a positive example. But let's not exploit the pandemic for commercial and cynical ends, which arguably this does. So prepare for a cyber pandemic 
you remember that immediacy? Secure your everything now. Click the thing. Click the thing. We've got a problem. People and organizations have suffered greatly from the coronavirus pandemic. That's true. Many critical lessons are being learned, but none more important than that another devastating crisis could be brewing. Devastating. A catastrophic cyber event has long been envisioned, and with today's digitally collected world, a global cyber pandemic is now a reality. This is nonsense, isn't it? What the heck is a global cyber pandemic? It's not a thing. And aside from being perhaps ethically and morally a little bit unsuitable, all this does is get people to buy a thing. Okay, so it's inaccurate, it's making full use of the sensitizing rhetoric. Um, but a public health framework for cybersecurity has actually been promoted for a while, and we're going back 10 years really, uh, where researchers have argued that what you could do is take the public health approach to communicable diseases, non-communicable diseases, and risk behaviors, and apply that to cyber and information security and say, right, we've got communicable threats, we've got non-communicable threats, and we have cyber risk behaviors. So perhaps what we can do is rather than harnessing people's fear, we can harness people's sense of civic and community responsibility. Because I know it's easy for us, isn't it, to say, oh, I've seen so many people not wearing masks. I've seen so many people, uh, you know, not behaving like they're supposed to, not socially distancing. But there are just as many people, aren't there, who are wearing masks, who are socially distancing, who are washing their hands. And maybe the time is ripe, rather than exploiting their fear to buy a thing, to harness these people and say, right, you know how you did that thing during coronavirus? Okay, have you thought about how you could protect yourself, your, your loved ones, everybody in your community, and your business in terms of cybersecurity and information security? We know it works. We know that public health works. Um, and just as a little reminder, I'm going to finish with evidence of this from the 1940s and courtesy of the Imperial War Museum in the UK. You may have met a few people who like doing this sort of thing. They're a nuisance, I agree, but pretty harmless. You have certainly seen thousands like this. They're not a nuisance. They're a real danger. Hi, stop it, you. Stop it, stop it. Come here. What do you think you're up to? You've probably infected thousands of people already. What do you think this is for? Yes, that's all right, but here's another way of using your handkerchief. Now sneeze. Come on. All right, never mind. Close your eyes. Now, handkerchief. Sneeze. <coughs> Sneeze, handkerchief. <coughs> Got it? Fine. <coughs> Understand? <coughs> handkerchief, sneeze. See what I mean? <coughs> That's the idea. <coughs> Fine. Now you can carry on. So with that, I'm going to finish off with a plea. Um, there are simple ways of encouraging people to protect themselves, protect others. Um, so let's have a think together about how we can do that without scaring the hell out of people, without trying to just harness their fear about an issue, but to harness also their sense of civic and community responsibility. And with that, thank you very much indeed. I'm going to be guided by you guys as to whether we've got any time for questions. Thanks a lot. So we do have time for questions, and I'd be particularly interested to hear from people who think I'm talking nonsense and would like to push back on what I've just said, or maybe you're all 
Oh, yes. I understand what you're saying about things like words like devastating, etc. What about the evolution of language and how word, the meaning of words changes yeah. and enter into the uh, vernacular, much as you know, Google means search? Yeah. Um, so how do you, whilst I, I agree with what you're saying, but also devastating definitely does not mean to raise a village to the ground. It's, it's, so in case at the back you didn't hear that, it's, um, it's a very, very good point about the evolution of language and how devastating might not necessarily um, just mean literally raising a village to the ground. So I would, I, I suppose my pushback to that would be we keep the vestige of it, we keep that kind of gut reaction to it, if you like, at a, at a physiological level, because that's the attachment we have with it. But you're absolutely right. These words get watered down. And I think, um, oh, it's, it's, this is the first reference to blaming everything on social media. Here we go. Um, so I do think that how people communicate online is really interesting. Um, if someone suffers an upset or um, grief of some kind online. We say that we're literally heartbroken, hun, don't we? Well, of course we're not literally heartbroken, but yet we say that we're heartbroken. It doesn't mean we've had a cardiac arrest. Um, so there is a sense in which that does absolutely get watered down. What, what I don't think we lose is that overall image that we refer to when we want to connect to it. And so reminding people about some of that is quite helpful, I think. Um, and so that's on the metaphorical side. With the hyperbole um, and the exaggeration, we're definitely getting more and more exaggerated. And online communication is more exaggerated, perhaps because we're limited to a certain set of characters. You know, it's not a lengthy blog. It's 140 or 280. So we have to be more definite. So we might ramp up how we feel about everything. Um, what that doesn't take away is the sense of how that's received. Um, and that particularly when we're talking about things like alerts, um, you know, that we need to feel sensitized. Oh my God, I need to do something about it. But yes, I think yours is a very good point. Anyone else? No, well, I'll be around all day. So thank you very much. Oh, yes. Right. Yes. <laughs> you need this now. This might help you a little bit. Is yes. It's it's the kind of communication of which I would approve. But I understand <laughs> it might not be great for sales figures. Um, yeah. And of course, what we have through Marshall McLuhan and everybody and the medium being the message is we have fifty to sixty years. Actually, probably about a hundred years of mass media marketing. And we have an advertising industry who are, you know, perfectly entitled to be there, but they all work to the same script, which is buy the thing now. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, and, and I'm not suggesting, I think it would be unreasonable of me to suggest, wouldn't it, that vendors stop trying to sell things? Um, but we are starting to see different representation. So I'm not going to name the product because I don't necessarily endorse a particular product, but we have one antivirus vendor. I don't know if the TV ads are over here, but they're certainly in the UK, um, where they um, get the, the internet and it's a room full of people and they stage an intervention and they say, so internet, we've brought you here today because we're not very happy about how our relationship is working out. And it's really, it's funny because you've got an 80 year old woman talking about the inappropriate image that she shared and now it's all over. And, you know, oh, I, they saw this image and everybody goes, oh, you know. So but you still feel like you should buy the product, I would argue. Um, but you're not being terrified by blue light and the Grim Reaper. And you're also not being told that there's nothing you can do about it. And I, and I think that's the, that's the helpful bit. Um, what I didn't talk about so much was um, in relation to the, the FBI website, you know, that's weird, isn't it? Because you've got to scroll through about 6,000 words to get some advice on cybercrime prevention. One of which, and I kid you not, is um, if all else fails, turn off your computer. <laughs> oh, which is not hugely empowering, right? So, um, so I, 
It would be nice to be able to seed some of this enabling and empowering messaging in with the buy it now thing. Okay. Thanks ever so much. Cheers.